So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to welcome the first speaker, who is Dr. Edward Walsh. Ed is the Chief of Electrophysiology at Boston Children's Hospital and has been here in post uh, since the 1980s and really is a pioneer to all of us for paediatric electrophysiology and inherited arrhythmia syndrome such as long QT syndrome. And it's going to be fascinating. He's going to give us an overview of his experience of long QT syndrome at Boston Children's Hospital. Ed, thank you very much. I want to thank Dominic for uh, organizing um, this conference. I, I think it's a great idea, and um, this is the way we should approach these sort of medical problems. It's, it, you have to get the patients involved, the families involved, because the feedback that we get from you lets us know um, what still needs to be done in the field and which direction we should go. So I thank everybody for attending today. Um, I'm a big fan of Winston Churchill, and that's not just because Dominic's here, um, but I, I pay a lot of attention to this quote of his, um, that the further backward you can look in history, the further forward you are likely to see. And uh, so I took a little liberty. Dominic uh, restricted me to 25 years of history of long QT. I thought I'd go back even a little further than that. Um, although I have the most gray hair in the room, uh, most of this occurred before I was born. So um, back before the American Civil War, um, when there was no electrocardiogram and nobody knew what a QT interval even was because it hadn't been defined yet, um, there, there was a case that was reported in the medical literature, which if you look back is probably the first report of long QT syndrome. Now, as many of you probably know, there's a, a, a severe form of long QT that is also associated with deafness. And this report came as an unfortunate little girl who was attending a school for the deaf and was getting reprimanded by her teacher. There was no specification on what that reprimand was, um, but she unfortunately collapsed. And um, when they went and uh, talked to the parents, um, the parents were not surprised because this had happened to another one of their children who was deaf as well. So um, this is an early indication that there's a genetic problem that can involve uh, long QT. And unfortunately back then there was no treatment available and things have certainly changed. So the EKG machine was invented uh, in the early 1900s um, in the Netherlands by a, a guy named Einthoven. Um, and he's the one who came up with the letters uh, that w go along with the EKG signal, so P, Q, R, S, and T, and, and the QT interval, uh, that was all defined by him back then. It took a while, over 50 years, before somebody actually started to look at the QT interval and associate it with disease processes. So uh, the first real report of uh, long QT syndrome, again, uh, um, it, it, it was involving patients who had the severe form with deafness. Uh, but this was a report out of uh, Norway where uh, there was a family, an unfortunate family, that had four out of six children um, who were deaf, um, who had had recurrent episodes of collapse. Um, and uh, three of those children, unfortunately, uh, passed away. Um, and obviously something like this would um, reinforce the potential that there's a genetic dis uh, component to long QT and uh, it was described by Gervell and Lang Nielsen. So this is a label that we used to put on long QT syndrome that was associated with deafness. And not too long after that, people began to scrutinize that QT interval a little bit closer. And uh, in 1963, uh, there was a report uh, from Italy of long QT syndrome and recurrent episodes of collapse, um, and uh, also one from Ireland. Um, came out uh, almost uh, simultaneously, but uh, these two doctors who described that, um, they put their names together to talk about long QT with normal hearing. So that was what was referred to as the Romano Ward syndrome. Now, there were a whole lot of uh, people working on trying to figure out this problem, um, and the cause of it. And the first theory that was um, c came about to uh, explain it was that there's nerves that go to the heart muscle. And it was felt that there was an imbalance of these nerves. And there was a little bit of reason that people would think that from experimentation you could see if the nerves on the left side were stimulated, 
uh, and you measured a Q uh, QT interval, it got longer, or if the nerves on the right side of the heart were injured somehow, the QT interval actually got shorter. So it was felt that the cause of long QT was an imbalance of the right and the left uh, nerves that innervate the heart. But then a lot of people started to think about it more, and they said, well, um, you know, we, we give certain drugs to people to treat arrhythmias. And what these drugs do is they actually affect the, the heart cells. And some people, when you give them these drugs, they get the same kind of arrhythmias that we see in long QT syndrome. And it wasn't related to the nerves at all. So this theory started to come along that maybe it's something abnormal in the, in the heart cells that causes long QT. So if you look at the heart cells, um, they're surrounded by a membrane. Uh, all cells have a membrane that goes around them. And these membranes are, are not solid. They have pores in them that are called ion channels. And that's where these anarrhythmic drugs uh, actually worked on these ion channels. So the, some people start to say, well, it isn't nerve imbalance. It's actually the ion channels of the heart. Uh, but it was just a theory. You couldn't prove anything. And it wasn't until 1991 when uh, Mark Keating, who was then working in Utah, uh, isolated uh, the first gene from a large family with a lot of patients who had long QT. So he took the, the DNA out of the nucleus of a cardiac cell, and he figured out what gene was abnormal, and bingo, um, that gene coded for an ion channel. So this was the time when it was all put together. This is 1991. That's not that long ago. So our understanding of this disease is pretty fresh. 1991, <clears throat> um, George Bush Sr. was president. Um, Beauty and the Beast was the big Disney movie then, so it's, it's really, really not that long ago. But during this time when people were trying to figure out what the cause was, we were finding patients who had the problem and we had to treat them. And uh, I entered the field, uh, I started studying cardiology in 1982, um, and there was a little bit known about how to manage patients with long QT then, but as you would expect, the only cases that were really being picked up on were the severe cases, so people who were having a lot of symptoms. And uh, the cause was still uncertain. Everyone was thinking about all the different theories. There were not a lot of treatment options. Um, patients usually weren't given medications unless they actually had symptoms, so the use of beta blocker was not standardized, and screening was not aggressive. So nowadays, when we find one patient who might have long QT, we look to the family and try to figure out if there's anybody else uh, in the family who could be a silent carrier of that same problem. So early in my career, this was a, a case that came into our emergency room. And it, it just shows you the state of the art. This is in the mid 80s now. So this was a young girl. She eventually did well, uh, but she was 12 years old and she had had recurrent blackout spells and she had fallen on one of these spells and um, got a cut on her head and um, they took her to the emergency room so she could get stitched up. And one of the uh, residents in the emergency room knew a little bit about long QT and he said, wow, how many times has she blacked out? And I said, well, four or five. He said, well, maybe I'll get an electrocardiogram. So he did. And um, it came out looking like a very funny T wave and U wave. Um, and cardiology was consulted to come down. Now, back then, we didn't have uh, doctors who were specialists in arrhythmias. You know, whoever the cardiologist of the day was would go down and see the patient. And, not all of them were, were real tuned into this QT thing, so they said, well, yeah, that EKG is a little bit funny, but I'm not sure that's really a T wave, maybe it's a U wave. Um, why don't we send that, that patient home and we'll see him back in clinic? So I heard about this and I said, well, you know, the least you ought to do is put on a 24-hour halter monitor, and we did. And while this patient was wearing the halter monitor, had an arrhythmia, that fortunately stopped on its own, but this is what the arrhythmia looks like in long QT syndrome, where the rhythm f suddenly becomes very fast and disorganized. So we actually got this young lady back to the hospital pronto and got her started on beta blockers and she's done well. And we also found a lot of other family members who had the same kind of electrocardiogram, none of whom have had symptoms, but uh, we tried to get treatment going for all of them as well. So around 1985, when I joined the staff, I said, well, you know, this is, this is not a problem for amateurs. We have to standardize how we treat arrhythmias in uh, 
uh, all pediatric patients, not just long QT, but everything else. So we started up a formal electrophysiology service. That was me back then. Um, and we started to screen better. We picked up more cases, including a lot of cases before the symptoms started. Um, we made strict rules for EKGs. <clears throat> so if somebody came in in the emergency room who had had a blackout spell, or uh, a, what someone might have thought was a seizure, it became mandatory that you got an electrocardiogram on that patient, and we found a lot of new cases. We started to see that there were some borderline EKGs, too, that we had to look at. Uh, it wasn't just the dramatic cases we were finding, it was a lot of the borderline ones as well. And we started using beta blockers more aggressively uh, in patients who had never had a symptom. Um, when people had the form of long QT that was associated with slow heart rate, we were a little more proactive in recommending pacemakers for some of them. And um, we started to use uh, implantable defibrillators, which <clears throat> were not available before 1984. They came, they came along, the first ones came along when I was in training at Mass General. And um, there were so few of them that Mass General was one of six places in the country who had access to defibrillators, and they were rationed one a month. Um, so. Uh, times have changed. Uh, defibrillator therapy is more readily available, and we started to use it in some particularly difficult cases in young patients. We also started a training program where uh, people in cardiology who became interested uh, in arrhythmia treatment, long QT, and other forms uh, could get uh, special training in that and go out to start their own program. What happened in the 1990s at Boston Children's is that there was a lot more emphasis on the basic science, and you'll hear a lot more about this today. Uh, David Clapham was recruited from Mayo Clinic. <clears throat> Bill Poo, who I think is speaking here today, is one of his protégés. Um, Dr. Keating, who isolated the first gene, worked here uh, in our labs for a while, um, along with uh, Igor uh, Splosky, who's uh, one of his uh, colleagues. Um, we did some genetic work ourselves, uh, Dr. Carol Sattler when she was here and Dr. Woody Benson when he was here. Um, we started to publish uh, some medical articles about um, the specific genetic mutations we were finding in, in some of our patients. And for the first time, we started to use gene testing in, in some tough cases to uh, help us with uh, clinical decision making. Um, now, we weren't the only ones doing things. Uh, there was a lot going on in the 90s regarding long QT and associated diseases. I mentioned uh, Mark Keating isolating the gene in 91. Uh, the Brugada brothers from Europe described a, a second cousin of long QT known as Brugada syndrome in 92. Um, Peter Schwartz from Italy came up with criteria that were practical ways of making the diagnosis of long QT in borderline cases. 1995, it wasn't until 95 that people realized there's more than one gene involved in long QT. It's not just one. It's not just the one that Keating found. There's other things as well. And it was 1997 when we could easily get um, genetic testing done, although it was still quite expensive, um, but it was a commercial lab rather than a research lab with better quality control that was starting to do the testing at that point. Um, Starting in the 2000s, we uh, at, at Children's Hospital started to off, offer new treatments. Um, there, e even though that nerve imbalance theory is not the correct cause of long QT, it does play into it. Um, and we started to do sympathectomy procedures. The first one that we did was in the year 2000, uh, and that patient is doing very well. We began to rely more on the genetic testing. We started some new medication trials. And um, in very desperate cases, we figured out ways of putting defibrillators into very young patients. The defibrillators are designed for adults, they're not uh, designed for children. And when we need to do it, uh, as in this little baby here, we figured out special ways of uh, adjusting the equipment to be used in, in children. Um, this current uh, decade, uh, there's a family program established, which is, uh, you're all the manifestation of that. Um, Dominic Abrams, we were fortunate to recruit from London, and he's worked with other Harvard institutions to start this family program, which I think is going to make a lot of progress. Um, Vasilios Bezridis joined our team um, as one of uh, Dr. Abrams' protégés, and uh, we have uh, nursing and research people assigned to the family program, and I think it's going to go forward 
uh, much more quickly than it has in the past. So just to give you an idea, this is our arrhythmia service. When I started in 1985, I was very lonely. Um, <laughs> but we, we certainly have a, a great team now of good people um, with a nurse specialist. And um, we're training fellows every year to go out and spread the word. And these are the locations of the fellows that we've trained in our program. So we're pretty well represented across the United States, Canada, and some international sites now. So I'm going to stop and say that uh, long QT syndrome treatment requires teamwork, um, not just doctors and nurses, but families um, and uh, researchers and the different support groups that you'll uh, probably be familiar with, such as the SADS Foundation, the Heart Rhythm Society, and the Pediatric and Congenital EP Society. And uh, even medical industry is involved in this too. We're trying to get them to design equipment that's better suited for pediatric use. So I'll stop there and thank you very much. Any questions for Dr. Walsh? No one? Yes. Well, I think that's the purpose of this conference. I, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about days of yore, um, but I think what you're going to hear from the rest of the speakers today is, is going to be the future. Um, and a lot of progress has been made in my career. Um, this has gone from being a problem that you're lucky if you spotted a case and caught it in time um, to being a very proactive approach to, to the arrhythmia problem and with good treatment options. So. Um, the more we learn about the basic science behind it, I think the smarter we'll get. Um, I, I don't want to speculate too much. I'm going to leave it for the other people to speculate because I, I, I think there may eventually be a way of controlling this problem um, by either a medication that tweaks the exact gene that is not right or perhaps with gene therapy. We'll see. <laughs>